Psalm 27, verse 13, and we want to talk today about a very common dilemma, our condition that exists for too many of God's people, and I might say happens to all of us at one time or another. The psalmist says in verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Here's a man who confesses that he had a close call. He didn't backslide. He didn't blaspheme. He didn't reject his God or walk away from his God. But he said, I fainted or I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Here's a man who is at a close call, who is telling us that he made it because he believed that he would see the goodness of God, not in the sweet by and by, but now. And he said, if you'll do what I did, you can be strengthened and revitalized, and you can be encouraged, and you can keep going. And then he tells us what he did. He waited on the Lord. There are many people who grow weary in the... Um, the Christian life. There are many people who, for one reason or another, kind of uh, lose out. They don't really turn to wickedness. They just get tired. And so many of you have commented on the sermon that I preached two years ago on spiritual fatigue. And uh, if you didn't hear that sermon or haven't heard the tape, you ought to let somebody make arrangements. Maybe I could find it in my file someplace if the district doesn't have it. Because this business of Christians getting tired, getting tired of even being good, is a very real problem. Now, it's hard for us to imagine when we're on the mountaintop that anybody could ever grow weary. But grow weary we do. And it's how we cope with that weariness that often determines our spiritual destiny. You see, it's kind of like, um, well, if a fellow faints, he can't give in the offering. Suppose my brother uh, sitting down here just kind of fainted. He just kind of passed out here. Now, he didn't backslide. He didn't steal anything. He didn't tell a lie. He just kind of keeled over there and uh, snuggled down on a pillow and uh, was in a faint while this service went on. He couldn't hear what I was saying. He couldn't sing. When the offering plates came by, he wouldn't respond. He'd be in the house of God. He'd be on a pew. But he would be totally insensitive to what was happening. And believe me, I've pastored long enough to know that there are a lot of God's children who drag into church on Sunday morning and sit down on a pew and thank God for a place to sit down. And they promptly pass out. Oh, their eyes are open, they're a little glossy, and they're looking straight ahead, but they're not aware of anything that is being said or done, and they don't participate in anything because they're in the condition the psalmist was in, he said, I almost fainted, and I would have fainted had I not believed to see God or the goodness of God in the land of the living. I heard of a preacher that fainted at a wedding. Now, often we think of the bride or the groom fainting at the wedding, but one of my friends, the minister, fainted at the wedding. And they had to stop the wedding and get him revived before they could go on. And I think one of the highest orders of business in the church might be just stopping everything and revive some of the saints who have painted on it. 
They haven't committed adultery. They haven't blasphemed. They're just out of gas. Their battery's gone dead. They're just kind of out of it. And the person who faints in church is exactly in the same place that the stone was over Lazarus' tomb. They had to roll the stone away before there could be a resurrection. And in a lot of churches, that's all it would take to have a resurrection is to get some of the dead stones rolled away. But instead of rolling them too far and out, the best thing is to, to do is get them in touch with the resurrection power. So instead of being a hindrance and a blockage to this flow of life, they participate in it. In Memphis, Tennessee, there is a large mansion that is a tourist attraction that is standing incomplete. It's called the Pink Palace. A man who was a multimillionaire started this magnificent building as his home. Somewhere between the time he started it and the time it was finished, his money ran out, and he never completed that. He just grew weary and exhausted his finance, and that was the end of it. And the empty, unfinished palace mocked him all the rest of his life. The little town that I grew up in, there was a man who had a similar experience. He got the walls and the roof of a house up, but he never got the windows and doors on. And for years and years, every time we went to town, we passed a house that was a very vivid evidence of a man who gave up before his job was finished. There used to be an old lady in one of the little uh, free Pentecost churches that I attended as a boy who invariably would stand up and testify. And we always had testimony service that didn't matter what. And her testimony was, I thank God that I am saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, and I want to see what is at the end of the Christian race. Pray for me that I'll hold out and make the last mile. Well, uh, I thought it was just a tired old record she was playing because she said the same thing over and over. But since I've been preaching, I found out that that may be a very valid request. Pray for me that I'll see what is at the end of the Christian race and make the last mile. Because if I preach 30 years and then backslide, I've forfeited all of my rewards and I have come short of seeing the glory of God, and I'll be mocked by the devil throughout eternity as I spend eternity in hell instead of heaven. I don't want to live right 25, 30, 40 years and then fall by the way, do you? I want to see what is at the end of a Christian race. I want to make the last mile. And I not only want to make the last mile, I want to go sweeping through the gates. And I want to arrive home victorious with a shout of victory in my soul. I don't want to faint and fall by the way. I want to keep moving on faithfully, letting God strengthen me day by day and giving me the courage and the strength I need to walk this way and carry these burdens and fight these battles. Moses endured, seeing him that is invisible. Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. And Daniel continued. The greatest thing that is said about Daniel is not that he went through the lion's den, but in the last verse of the first chapter of the book of Daniel, it simply says, and Daniel continued. Daniel continued through changes of government. He continued through change of personal circumstance. He changed all kind of things happened to him and all kind of misunderstandings and persecution. He was elevated and demoted. But through it all, he continued. Praise God. What good would it have done Daniel to go through the lion's den had he failed before he reached the end of the way? What good to go through the fiery furnace and be kept by the fourth man only to deny God later? 
the streets of cities like Portland and Seattle and Los Angeles have thousands of people walking them who have once known the joy of the Lord, who have once preached the gospel. If all the backsliders in Oregon were to come into this camp meeting and worship again or attend the camp meeting they've once attended, we'd have to have five services a day and not let anybody in twice. These hills and valleys are filled with people who have fallen by the way. And I have a cold chill every now and then to think that after I've loved my Lord and served Him and felt His grace and His power in my life, that I might in a moment of discouragement fail Him and disgrace Him. I don't want that to happen. And I'll hasten to say I believe as long as I don't want it to happen, it won't happen. It's a lot harder to backslide than most Pentecostals believe. I don't believe in eternal security, but I do believe in security. It's God's good pleasure to keep his own. He will fight our battles for us. He will give us grace and then give us more grace. But I think there has to be a resolve on the part of the believer to want to be kept. And I think one of the preventive maintenance things we can do is to recognize some of the reasons men faint or fall by the way. I would suggest, first of all, that a bad spiritual atmosphere or climate is conducive to falling away. When Peter walked down the street, his shadow brought healing to those that lay where his shadow would touch them. But Herod called for the head of John the Baptist to be cut off because he was influenced by the atmosphere of a wild party and the dancing of a wicked woman. If we live in a bad spiritual atmosphere, it will take its toll. That's why we need to have the gut and the gumption to walk out of any situation that drains our spiritual resource. The television can become a sewer pump, pumping right out of hell, right into your living room. What we read, who we talk to. Now, I went to a fellow's house once when I first started preaching, had dinner with him, and when I left, I got in the car and I felt so dirty. And the Lord said to me, where have you been and what have you been talking about? And I hadn't particularly entered into the conversation, but I'd sat through two hours of that guy running down every preacher and his brother in the country. And the Lord convicted me of it, and I promised God as I drove out of the driveway that if he would forgive me, I would never go back to that man's house again. I've kept that promise. My spiritual well-being is more important than the friendship of a sick gossip. Amen. It comes a time when you need to have the discernment to know whether or not you can dominate a situation and influence it for righteousness or whether the brave and the wise thing to do is walk away from it for your own protection. I'm just selfish enough I want to go to heaven. And I want to be wise enough and strong enough in the Lord to walk away from anybody or anything that would contaminate my mind and soul and drag me down to sin in the pits of hell. So a bad atmosphere. You know, some of you ladies have a responsibility before God to keep your WMC meetings wholesome and healthy. Because if you don't, they'll deteriorate to gossip and tension. Fellowship times sponsored by the church can become either a spiritual treat or a damnation. And you can begin to rake over all the faults and failures of everybody you know in the church, or you can begin to uh, allow how perhaps you need a new minister or uh, dwell on the faults of the man of God that God has sent to lead you. And the first thing you know, the whole conversation and the whole environment is sick and sick with gloom and discouragement and God's spirit is grieved and you will pay the price if you stay in that atmosphere. 
You may not be able to help what other people do, but you can help what you participate in. So if you want to stay healthy spiritually, you live in good, fresh, clean, heavenly air where you can breathe deep and where you can keep your soul clean and pure and your mind clean and pure. Amen? I can't help other people telling dirty stories, but I don't have to listen. I may not be able to save a person from becoming extremely critical, but I don't have to participate. The sight of blood or the thought of sacrifice and suffering often cause people to faint. The disciples of the Lord often say, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest without knowing what the price will be. But I want to tell you, it costs to serve God. It costs, but it pays. Rich dividends. But if you follow the Lord long enough, you're going to hear him say, take up my cross. You are going to be called upon to participate in the fellowship of his suffering. And suffering takes on many forms. You may be called on to give heavy financially. You may be called on to put in long, hard hours. You may be called on to go to some obscure place. You may be called upon to give of your physical strength. And a lot of people facing what it's going to cost to do the will of God faint and fail to carry through. The sight of blood. I was in Daytona Beach, Florida years ago uh, conducting a revival meeting and the parsonage was right beside the church and one morning we was eating breakfast. Two cars collided right out in the intersection. I jumped up. I was young and healthy and strong. Never thought about it bothering me. And there was a person laying out there bleeding. And I ran up to them and going to help them. And all of a sudden it was like a, a brick fell out of the top of my head into my stomach. And I all but passed out. A big old strong six foot two uh, preacher ought not to faint when he's needed. But I did. And I had to run. And get away from the place. Of course, there's other people there to help. I suppose if there hadn't been anybody else, I'd have managed to stay with it. But I felt like an idiot almost when it was over. But I, I all of a sudden, bang, the sight of blood. And a lot of times in camp meetings, we can say with good ease, wherever you go, Lord, I'll go with you. And whatever you want me to do, that I will do. And later when we see the price tag on that, it's easy to back out. But God give us the grace to with strong resolution and absolute devotion and love that is without flaw, say to God without hesitation, I meant it, God, and I will go all the way. Whatever it costs, whatever you ask me to give up, whatever sacrifice I'm called on to pay, whatever commitment you want, I don't want to faint because the hill is steep and the burden is heavy. The secret of spiritual victory is often just staying with the task that God has given you. Paul prayed that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering. Now what does that mean? There may be many meanings. Physical suffering, mental suffering. We may be called on to go to our own Gethsemane and our own Calvary. And many of us have been there. But you know the most painful suffering of all was the rejection of Jesus' own kindred. The fellowship of his suffering entails the rejection and the misunderstanding of those who ought to love you and ought to love what you're doing. Many a man of God has received a vision and a call from God and he's had to walk on alone while relatives and friends and other believers thought he was absolutely insane. But I want you to know if our Lord says follow me, that ought to settle the debate in the discussion. We ought to be willing to take up the cross and go all the way. 
without fainting and without falling by the way calling upon his resources continually knowing that his grace is sufficient and that he will give us daily bread and he will breathe upon us the power of the holy spirit even if even when we're confronted with the with the challenge of sacrifice and suffering of want and need and misunderstanding i know as well as i know god ever called me to do anything god called me to to lead the pentecostal world into an involvement in the missionary ministry of bible translation i know with all of my heart i know that many of my friends are not going to understand and many of them already think i'm touched in the head to give up a fine church and turn down invitations to come and pastor other fine churches in order to give myself to primitive people but i'll tell you without hesitation the call to do this is just as strong as the call to preach was in the first place amen and i am not making any boast or any brags but i'm asking you i'm asking you in jesus name and i'm asking you with all the the pathos of my soul dear friends pray for me i don't want to fall by the way and i don't want to fail people who have never heard the name of jesus i want to do what god has called me to do without hesitating or without turning back even at the risk of financial loss or even at the risk of friends not understanding i want to walk in his blood-stained steps all the way some of us faint by the way simply because of physical or mental weakness elijah sat down and prayed to die because he was tired i love preachers and i've lived in their homes and i've hand carried many a man of god through trials and difficulties one of the most precious aspects of my ministry has been that over the years god has somehow or other given me empathy and compassion for men of god and their burdens and their problems until preachers come and talk to me and i have the privilege of praying with them and encouraging them in, in the lord i've had to carry men spiritually but i've also had to be carried and it's a wonderful thing to have a brother that you can trust and you can depend on who's not going to look down his nose at you because you're fighting a tremendous battle and it's amazing how many preachers wives have nervous breakdowns and physical collapses not because they're wicked not because they're rejecting the call of god but because of the long hard hours and the demands that are placed upon them my wife has shed many more tears than i have in the ministry most preachers wives weep more than their husbands because there's a bit of cruelty that goes with some people they don't have the courage to face the pastor themselves so they take it out on his wife and his children often the wife is the first one to hear criticism often the wife is the first one to hear the gospel often the wife is the first one to hear the unkind remark and i've had more than one minister's wife just simply say i'm not tired of living for god i'm just tired of this and it's not unusual to get tired it's not unusual to grow weak and weary and we will think in these times of physical exhaustion and mental exhaustion and an emotional drain unless we do what the psalmist did he went to the house of god and there he believed god to see the goodness of god now in the land of the, of the living praise god some of us like the prophet grow weary because of a lack of food we give and give and give and give i preach i preach i preach until i hear myself preaching in the night sometimes and it's such a wonderful treat to sit on the platform and hear a great man of god like willard canlon a ray shock or somebody like this open the word of god and i feed on it amen 
I don't care what it costs you to get to camp meeting. It's worth every dime you spend. If you have to go home and eat beans and soup and bread for a while, it's worth it. Because you need the food you're getting in these services. Because God doesn't want you to fall by the way. He wants you to be strong in the Lord and strong in the power of his name. So eat well. A lot of people eat a lot of cotton candy and froth. You can't keep the spiritual victory feasting on TV soap operas. You can't keep the spiritual victory listening to a little frothy uh, sermonizing. You know when it's froth and when it's meat. And even the meat may be just a little more difficult to chew and accept sometimes, but you need to hear the strong teaching of God's Word and you need to open your heart to it and you need to get into the Word for yourself and let the Holy Spirit feed your soul the T-bone of heaven. Hallelujah. Others faint because of chastisement. If he loves us, he will chasten us. And we are told not to despise the chastening of the Lord. How many of you have ever been to God's woodshed? Boy, you're looking at a fellow that has. I remember once when I knew God was laying the rod on me. And I remember crying out, Oh God, whatever you're trying to teach me, for God's sake, let me learn it. I don't want to go through this grade again. All of us have been chastened to the Lord. And it's hard not to chafe under the chastening. It's hard not to resent the discipline. And sometimes when we get just a bit haughty and a bit high-minded and we think a little more of ourselves than we ought or we get in a, uh, an overzealous attitude and we run ahead of God or we get rebellious, our Heavenly Father takes the razor strap to us. And don't you think you've been serving God long enough that you've outgrown that? Oh, I hate to go to God's woodshed and have him turn me over and just blister me. And spiritual pride keeps me from con conceding that that's where I am sometimes. I want to blame other Christians. I want to blame the church. I want to blame the devil even. But it's a blessed thing when in humility we say, God, I know where I am. And I know who's using the razor strap. And Lord, you chasten me until my spirit is broken before you. And I'm willing to say yes, an eternal yes to God. I remember years and years ago, I heard some of these preachers, I was just young and very impressionable, and I heard some of these preachers preaching on uh, prosperity, you know, that uh, all of God's people are supposed to drive new Cadillacs and, and have $100 bills for change and never be broke. Well, I, I just know God blesses some people like that because he can trust them with it. So I got in the pulpit and I got very bold and very rash. And I announced to the devil and to the church and to God and to my wife.
and I was going to appropriate it by faith, and from that day forward I was going to have more than enough. I want you to know for the next three months my car payments were $100 a month and I got less than $100 a month in my office. In fact, at the end of three months, it was, the situation was so bad, I was building a little three-room cottage on a lot back of my mother's house, and I was trying to pay for it as I went, and I'd buy a few pieces of lumber every time I went home and nail them up, and uh, it had been about a two-year project. And I went home, and, and uh, a man came by, and he said to me, what are you going to do with that sink laying there? And I looked at him, and I said, I'm going to sell it to you if you want it. And he said, well, that's exactly what I'd like to do is buy it. I got home from a year of preaching the gospel with $2 in my pocket. It was Christmas and it was three weeks till the next offering. And I had to sell my own kitchen sink to survive. Finally, I remembered that back the last of September, I made this dumb speech. And since making that speech, it's been downhill all the way. Oh, why did it take me three months? Because I am stupid, and I am dense, and I am dull sometimes. But suddenly it dawned on me, and I confessed the folly of my arrogance. And I asked God to forgive me, and then God opened the windows of heaven, and our needs began to be supplied again. It wasn't that God didn't want to supply my need. He just wanted to teach me not to be a brat that was going to stand up and be arrogant about his thing. We thank God for the loaves and fishes. We thank God for our homes. We thank God for our cars. But we have to come to a place where we serve him, fishes or no fishes, loaves or no loaves. Amen. And we serve him whether we're sick or well. We serve him whether the heavens are brass or whether they're open with copious showers of God's blessing. I hope I'm to a place in my spiritual maturity where I'm saying, God, I will serve thee. Period. No ifs and ands about it. I will serve thee. So some faint because of the chastising of the Lord, not knowing that the way to relieve the chastising is instead of rebelling against it or instead of despising it, is to embrace it and say, thank you, God, that you love me enough to discipline me. Some faint because they just simply did get discouraged and give up too quick. Discouragement comes to all of us repeatedly. There's no person here that can convince me that you don't become discouraged sometimes. There's no person here that can convince me that there are days when you wouldn't just like to run away from it all. Discouragement is a favorite tool of the devil to tell you that people don't care, people don't, are not interested in what you're doing, people are not interested in you as an individual, the church has forgotten you, the pastor has forgotten you, heaven has forgotten you, and you get to feeling alone and empty, and you pray prayers that as far as you know are not answered, of course all prayers are answered, God either says yes or no or wait a while. And when he says wait a while, he's got something better in mind. And he's got to bring you to the place where you can realize the full benefit of his intent toward you. But we do get discouraged. We do feel alone. And we do feel left out. And sometimes it's because of glandular problems that create a chemical imbalance in our lives and our moods are altered. This has nothing to do with our standing in grace. Aren't you glad that your moods don't have anything to do with your standing in grace? As far as God is concerned, in grace 
I'm just as much a child of God when I'm blue and despondent as I am when I'm speaking in tongues. He doesn't forsake me. And he doesn't leave me out. And my moves do not affect God. They only affect my feelings. I think I told you when I was here before about the man who decided to backslide. But it was, it's worth repeating because it illustrates exactly what I'm trying to say to you this morning. There's a man who was, uh, had been a Christian several years. But he'd been having a rough time. On this particular day, he was trying to uh, harvest hay. And he was working with a team and a hay rake, and the team wouldn't work right, and the hay rake broke, and uh, everything went wrong. And for the first time since he'd been a Christian, he had an urge to use profanity. There didn't seem to be any words in his vocabulary that would express him his disgust, his anger at this team and this equipment without resorting to profanity. And when he realized that he had had an urge to curse, he said, that proves it. I can't live right. If I was where I ought to be with God, I wouldn't have this urge. And so I'm going to quit. I might as well quit and get it over with. But he said, I'm a gentleman. I started this Christian life on my knees. I'm going to quit on my knees. So he tied his team and he got down on his knees and he told God what I've just told you. He said, God, I'm, I've been weak. It's getting worse. And I, I, I've felt for a long time I couldn't live for you. And this morning I had the urge to use profanity. And that proves that I'm backslidden and I can't make it. So I'm going to quit. So I've come to tell you goodbye. I'm going back in sin, but I did want to tell you before I go that I'd, I have enjoyed living for you. And he said, God, I, I really appreciate, I really appreciate all the good things you've done for me. And I'm just sorry that I'm no better than I am. I really wish I was strong enough to hold out. But God, I'm weak, so I'm quitting. But before I go, I want to thank you, God, for healing our baby that night when it was about to die. I really appreciate that, God. And I'm sorry that I can't live for you to show you how much I appreciate it. And God, I want you to help my wife because she's going to sure be hurt when she finds out I'm back to her. And it's going to be hard on her to try to live a Christian life with an unsaved husband. So, Lord, please strengthen her. She's a good woman. And this went on. One thing brought on another that he wanted to praise God for and pray about. An hour later, he came to himself, and he was running and leaping and shouting and dancing in the Spirit all over that back forty. And when he came to himself, he said, Never mind, Lord. I believe I can make it after all. Oh, praise God. Oh, God's not offended by our discouragement. God's not offended by our weakness. He just wants us to share it with him. Oh, praise God. The psalmist said, I would have fainted. I had a close call. But I believed God. And I believed I'd see his goodness in the land of the living. Praise God. This man had fainted had he not gone to God's house and got into God's presence. He prayed without ceasing. Paul found himself caught in a great storm and that storm raging around him. And the sun and the moon hadn't been seen in many days. And everybody despaired of their life and Paul went down into the ship and had himself a prayer meeting. And when he came out of that time of conversing with God, he stood on the deck of that ship in the storm and he told the captain and the crew, Sirs, I believe God. 
The storm was just as fierce as it ever was. The stars still couldn't be seen. The moon still couldn't be seen. The sun was still darkened. The waves were still high. The little boat still was tossed. But here's a man who has touched God, and instead of being a victim of the storm, he's standing there in the teeth of the storm saying, Sirs, I believe God. That's exactly what God wants to do for you this morning. He wants to pull you into the orbit of his love, quicken you with his presence, and reveal himself to you where you can say, As I prayed, God was near, and God revealed himself to me. And because God touched me, because God revealed himself, because God quickened me, oh, hallelujah, my faith has been stimulated and my courage renewed. And storm or no storm, I believe God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that with the psalmist we can say, that we believe in the ultimate triumph for the righteous. The battle is the Lord. There's a cause at stake. When Hezekiah was about to die, and it's recorded both in Isaiah and in Kings, but Isaiah's version, and it's also in the Psalms, when Hezekiah was about to die, he turned to the wall and wept. And he prayed a great prayer. And included in that prayer is one of the most profound principles of prayer you will ever see. He said, The living shall praise thee. Death cannot celebrate you. The grave cannot praise thee. But the living, O God, will make thy truth known as I do this day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's a man in desperation and in one of the boldest acts of faith ever recorded in the Word of God. Walks right into the presence of God and says, God, if I die, you're not going to get anything out of it. The grave can't celebrate you. Death can't praise you. If you want your name honored, you're going to have to let me live so I can make your truth known. Hallelujah. A defeated, initiated Christian is no honor to God. A discouraged, humiliated believer is no honor to God. A Christian ragged and dragging in the dust of defeat is no honor to God. Why don't you by faith walk right into the presence of God and look God right in the eye and say, God, defeat doesn't honor you. Discouragement doesn't praise you. But the living shall praise thee. The living shall celebrate thee. The victorious shall honor thy name. So let me live. Let me live. And you know, before Isaiah got out of the king's court, God turned him around and said, you go back and tell him I'm going to add 15 years to his life. Hallelujah. I'm asking God to let a mighty, mighty bolt of spiritual electricity strike this place as I come to the close of this message and a mighty infusion of divine life come to every one of us. Praise God as we take hold of this truth that the living shall praise thee. The grave can't celebrate you. Defeat can't celebrate you. A defeated church can't celebrate you. A destroyed, divided body of believers can't celebrate you. A person with the blues and a person with pain can't celebrate you. A backslider can't celebrate you. But oh God, let me live, let me live. And as I live, I'll make your truth known. I'll honor your name. Oh, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God gets no glory out of you being mauled and pulverized by the onslaught of the wicked one. God wants to come in a mighty baptism of courage, power, and victory to quicken every believer here. God wants you to stand in his presence and in Jesus' name with boldness and courage. Say to God, 
The grave can't celebrate you. Death can't praise you. If you want your name honored, you let me live. And I'll make your truth known. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll celebrate you. I'll praise your name. I'll honor you. So come, Holy Spirit. Come in your power. Come in your quickness. Come in your glory. And revive me again. And renew me again that I may make thy truth known. Come on, let's stand to our feet. And let's put our hands toward heaven. And say, God, let me live again.